Hey everybody, it's the 3D Printing Professor, and today I'm very excited to bring you an interview with a man who uh, I found through my son, uh, an author, a game designer, and a new 3D printer owner. His name is Lou Anders. So Lou, how are you doing? Hey, thank you. Happy to be here. So, and also we are joined by my son who brought uh, your, your game and your book to my attention, Lou. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Lou. Well, uh, I'm a children's book author. I write the Thrones and Bones series from Random House Kids. First book, Frostborn. Second book, Nightborn. Third book, Skyborn. It is a fantasy adventure series about uh, a girl whose father was a frost giant. So she is seven feet tall at the age of 12. And a boy who's an obsessive gamer who hook up for a series of adventures. And of course, um, by board, gamer in the book, you mean board games. Board gamer. The only games they had in mythical past. <laughs> That's right. But, um, analogous mythical past. Uh, before that, I worked in science fiction and fantasy publishing for 15 years, uh, working for companies up in New York. Prior to that, I, I rode the dot-com bubble up and down, hard and fast. And before that, I spent five years in Los Angeles, hanging out on science fiction and fantasy television shows and writing about it for British magazines. Wow, <laughs> that is a heck of a resume, man. So, uh, how are you finding being an author? I, I gotta say, I love the cover of your third book. A minotaur is riding on a giant scorpion. Like that is spin the wheel of coolness. Pick two objects. Dang, that's awesome. <laughs> what, what else would a minotaur ride on? <laughs> Why? Uh, yeah, if I put them on a horse. It's too close to a cow. No, that makes perfect sense. They're not a centipede. I don't know. Well, yeah, if, you get, if you look really close at the cover, you can see that there are balconies along all the walls. With I know, I saw that one. Yes. I love that. I was in the book. I was like, wait a minute. There are trees. And so from then, I was like, wow, the entire cover has completely changed for me for the rest of my life. Well, it was, that cover was interesting because they wanted to have, you know, the first book be blue, the second book be red. And then we had already chosen the chase through the Minotaur city. It's a it's a labyrinthian city. The city is a maze. And they being, that's, that's that's a little bit Minotaurist, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's a little bit running of the bulls too. But uh, oh, so, oh so, yeah. So we'd already come up with a concept for the cover when the art department came back and said it needs to be green. And I'm like, well, it's it's a, it's a city. It's going to be a whole bunch of like reddish brown walls. <laughs> and so the city got a lot more green after that. We rewrote it so the, the streets are grass and there's a lot of foliage on the oh, walls just to give us that I green. I picture the walls being gray. I think I missed the part where it said the walls were covered in foliage. I missed that part. I missed that part. I don't know if it says foliage in the book. I, I, did, I did change the dirt streets to grass streets. That's very cool. Uh, and that, how often do you find that, that the artwork that you're working on, like, like you have to refine your process as you're working on it? Well, it, in terms of the cover art, the book's usually done uh, before the cover art comes in. And, you know, you write a book and, and you, you rewrite it several times and you hand it in and your agent makes you rewrite it and then you hand it in and then your editor makes you rewrite it. So Frostmourne, for instance, went through six or seven drafts before it came out. Wow. Uh, now, I, uh, I like to work with um, cartographers. And, and when I was an editor, I had a, a, a writer named Erin Hoffman. And she, we were working on a book with her. And she said, Lou, I'll have a map for you in the next month. And I said, Erin, uh, we'll, we'll do your map. You know, we're... We, we, we pay for people's maps. We'll do your map. You don't have to pay for your own map. And she said, no, no, I want to own my map. I want it to be my map. I'm doing the map. And I felt really guilty about that. And then Frostborn sold, and a little voice in my head went, Aaron's a genius. I better do the map before someone else does it wrong. And uh, <laughs> I work with Robert Lazaretti, who uh, people may know from Dungeons & Dragons. He used to do all the Dungeons uh, – not all. He did a lot of Dungeons & Dragons maps back in the TSR days. And now right, does right. A, map for, a lot of maps for the Pathfinder role-playing game. And Rob and I will work on the map while I'm writing the book. And in the second book, I needed a character 
to do something in one part of the city and then show up a chapter later in another part of the city. And, and when the map, to sure they weren't too far apart. Right. And when the map came out, I saw it was impossible. And I changed the book rather than the map because the map was completely – and that will happen. Or there was one spot on the map where he kept putting something in, and I kept saying, no, that's not what I mean. Change it, change it, change it. And for some reason, we just weren't communicating. And so finally, I'm like, you know what? That's what it looks like. I'll change the text. We won't change the map. Uh, I, in, in some ways, it's easier to make small tweaks to text than it is to to doing art, having done both. You, know, you mentioned, I don't know if you've seen this project of mine. You mentioned the Minotaur City. A while ago, I had made a Minotaur Mini. Uh, let's see if we can get to focus on that. But he's playing, it's a Minotaur Bard playing a cowbell because we need more cowbell. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> And it, this is fully 3D printed, so you see his arms are up in a way that everything prints with proper overhang. So it prints without supports. It comes out printing just fine. Uh, you can download this 3D model and print it right now, and it, it looks beautiful, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit biased, but I think it turned out fantastic. Wait, Minotaur Bard? What's that? I have, I Bards have... are people who play music. Yes. Yeah. In some contexts, magical music. Yes, exactly. Music that, that boosts the stats of the people around yeah. them or helps them heal or things like that. And there, this was actually from a gag in World of Warcraft at one point. Oh, I turned off autofocus, so it won't do it. Uh, in World of Warcraft, they made an April Fool's joke about a new bard class in World of Warcraft. And uh, this was one of the pictures that they showed, and so I translated it to 3D and into a 3D printed mini. So. Well, that's beautiful. I'm doing it. It was awesome. The beard part close up is amazing. Yeah, it looked pretty good, I thought. Wait, can I? Yeah. There were actually some printing errors on there that I just painted over. <laughs> All right, so let's let's shift to talking about board games. You you are a big uh, um, board game player, miniatures game player. You you, you like your D and D and other games as well. What's it like okay. uh, aside from the the miss or Fro not <laughs> Frostborn series? Uh, the Thrones and Bones series. Do you make board games very often? You've had to make three board games that I know of. Are there are there others that I don't know of? No, just those three. I um and I I I'm a bigger role playing gamer than a board game. And okay. uh, and but when I when I when I started Frostborn, I knew that my girl character was extremely athletic. Um. She plays the Viking sport Kamat Liker, which is kind of rugby with baseball bats with Vikings, which was a real game they played. And uh, when I created the boy, he couldn't also be into sports, but he needed to be into something. He couldn't just be into nothing. Uh, you know, there's got to be something positive that he excels at. And I was thinking about it for a long time, and I realized, and I, and I, and I read that the Vikings were extremely into board games. They were very, very avid board gamers. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was right, and I, you know, I had this revelation that gamers have always been gamers, have always been gamers, and they would be as obsessed about those board games as m me and my son are about video games. And uh, it was right after that that they discovered that 20-sided Grecian die. Did you see that online? Uh, yeah, I did, actually. And, and the uh, die... Uh, tower that they found and then also I've got uh, I recently made a 3d printed version of the ancient yes. board game of Ur. I saw that I saw that I uh, hold the earth off because that, that we're gonna come back to Ur. absolutely um, so uh, the game the Vikings played was called Hanefa Tafel and it was in the Tafel family of games and they never wrote down the rules but they wrote down bits and pieces of them and so when you go online and look up an apple, you'll find multiple iterations. And, you know, some are played on nine square boards and some are played on 12 or 15 square boards. And some use dice. Some have special marked corners. Some don't. And when I was writing the book, I thought, I can just crib from this. I'll just borrow somebody else's rules. And I don't really need to know. And as the book went on, I realized I really, really needed my own, to know what kind of rules I was working with. And would it be better if they were my rules? So I went to a craft store and I bought a bunch of wooden dowels and paint pens and a 12 by 12 board. I made a board. I settled on nine by nine. And then I spent a week just um, 
playing every iteration I could get my hands on and going, well, I like this rule, but I don't like this rule, and I like this now, rule. This who did you play against? Do you have, does your family uh, tolerate playing a bunch of games with you? My or do you son and I friends? played obsessively for a while. And uh, so he played with me a lot, and then I, I, I picked and choose, and I played myself. I played myself over and over again. You know, Karn plays himself in the, in the first chapter. I played myself. Yeah, Gabe, Gabe knows your book. So, Gabe, actually, uh, let's circle back to the books. Tell the story of how you found Thrones and Bones. So, one day I was at a library hoping that, oh, maybe that book that I put on, uh, that I ordered is in. One of the Game Night 999 sale, books sale. or something like it that, was, right? It, yeah, it was not in. And so I was just looking around, and we had to go, and I was like, uh, I need a book. And so uh, Dad was like, okay, how about this book? And I was like, Mm, I was I was no, suggesting no. to him a couple of different ones from off the shelf that looked interesting to me, and he was he was snubbing every single one of them. Then a librarian came up, and I was and she was like, "This is a good series." And I was like, "Okay, I like the title. I like the title and the cover." So I flipped it over by the back. Oh my goodness, I have to read this. So so the back quote that you had on the on the cover of your first book, something about. I do so like. I, something yeah, about loving I, I do so love to have visitors. The dragon's cool. That hooked him so much that he was convinced he was going to love He didn't even know there were board games in the book. And he was convinced he would love it. And then he found the board game in it. And, oh, it's been an obsession. It's been marvelous. I even really brought it to school and played it with a few people there. Excellent. Well, you almost did a dragon voice there. Do you do a dragon voice? Uh, every I read the back, t like, ten times. Yeah, he, he when he does his dragon, he drops into his dragon voice, and it's, it's very cool, very cool. I'm a nerd. But then, then you found that board game, and, and you, you, you and your brother. Uh, so Gabe, hang on, I, I keep trying not to. But he he takes this game. Uh, he made this version of of Thrones and Bones your game. Uh, which he did himself in Tinkercad. So he did the 3D modeling himself, um, mostly. No, you pretty much did it yourself. Okay, well, hold it up. Go for it. Grab grab the black drow. I think he looks oh, beautiful. Yeah. Oh, can we also have the original mini version, too, so that I can show, like, pitiful? Better. What mini version? These guys? Yeah, those guys. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He made it. He made a small chip. So this is the cool thing so, about 3D printing is oftentimes put them up. We uh, experimented, and so yeah. we found... Mini, he looks kind of pitiful, doesn't he? He's okay. Ben. Boom. In the, yeah. the, the difference between the two, let's put them side by side so we can compare, is the second one fills the space, the right. horizontal space better, so he ended up being taller as well. And it looks fantastic. It looks and you painted the black with nail polish? Yeah, exactly. So he, he put a, a pattern on the surface right. uh, by, by doing relief, essentially, uh, taking the three D or taking the two D shape, extruding it out into a three D shape, and then punching a hole out of the shape. So now we have a little relief in there, and then I just got some cheap nail polish from the dollar store. We constituted we it, painted it on there, and it overpainted the whole thing. It was a mess. But then we we rub it off with acetone, so only the top surfaces get rubbed off, showing yeah, through right. the pattern on there. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. And I use I use the same technique uh, on the Yep. Yeah. And so before I acetoned this, it was a ugly, ugly mess. And then you rub acetone over it and all of a sudden, woo, it looks pretty, you know. <laughs> Although I did notice one mistake when me and Andrew were playing this game. That right there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't have the, the thing. Yeah, well, you know, we make we make constellations for the board to be able to fold it in half. And um the shoe maidens and the mini shoe maiden. Uh, the original shield maiden? They are practically identical. Literally the same size. Although yeah. I can say that the original had a ton of bubbles on it. So, Well, and one thing that we did in the final version was we decided that the, the Jarl side and the Draug side would be printed in one in white and one in yellow so that they both still show through all right. And the best part is the uh, skeletons really look like old decaying skeletons. Yeah. I... I I think the shield maiden, the draw. I think they all turned out. Go for it. I I, I think they all turned out fantastic. Myself, yeah, they look beautiful. They look beautiful. Yeah, I may have to print some. 
the pattern for those are online, so uh, you could go and download it and print your own if you want. Uh, now, tell tell let's tell me a little bit about your three D printer. You recently got a three D printer. How are you loving it? I'm loving it. I've only had it a couple weeks. Uh, I got what the kind Prusa. Is it? It's the Prusa, the MK two i three MK two. Good choice. I, I, well, I I um uh, I, I got I'm friends with the guy. I'm now Facebook friends with the guy that runs Fat Dragon Games. And they mm -hmm. make a lot of 3D printing models for tabletop gamers. And so he owns about six printers. And I asked him what his favorite printer was. And he said, hands down, the Prusa. Uh, and then I explained how untechnical I am. <laughs> and uh, and, he, and he, still, he still endorsed the Prusa. Well, so, you know, there, there's, uh, there are 3D printers out there that are simpler and, and easier to use. You generally pay a higher price for a better user interface. Now, there are a couple of printers that I'm my, – my old Replicator 1 here is a workhorse. They no longer make these machines. And you can tell I've got janky fans hooked up to it. I've modified the heck out of this thing. Uh, I would not recommend this to a new user. It's just too much hands-on work. Uh, the the MP Mini Select, uh, Select Mini, is a great 3D printer, great user interface, but tiny build surface. When I made the board for this game, I had to cut it up into parts in order to print it on this printer, but I wanted it to be possible to print on that printer, so I was, you know, I made that happen. Um, but it's got a great user, but it's still not, like the process is still make the model into three it, on your computer, prepare it in your computer, then take it over to the, th why can't we just shoot a 3D model at the 3D printer and let it handle the preparation of the model? You know, we're not there yet. Yeah, yeah. So it's still, even the best 3D printer that's out there right now, it's still a very hands-on process to get it from 3D model to 3D print. And, you know, we can't, uh, a, a, having a better printer that's solid and requires less maintenance is to me more important than having one that is easier to use but doesn't you know work as well so Prusa is a great choice it's a solid printer it'll work great but you do got to get your hands dirty a little bit there's been some there's been some tweaking and adjusting and I'm and I'm sure there's more ahead than I <laughs> yeah well, and, and if you got any questions, uh, you got a guy now. You can you can ask me, and I'll let you know. <laughs> well, I'll show you what I've. And these are all the, the 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 you know the the files I've bought from Fat Dragon. But I'm making. Ah, uh, is that a board game? Is that another board game? It's a it's a it's an oh. RPG miniature game. I'm going to put it on your screen, Luke, so that uh, everybody will see this. It's an RPG miniature game. So they they play. Uh, you play D and D with it. It's it's yep. theater of the mind essentially, but you use the minis on the board to tell you what you're doing. So he's exploring a cave. You enter this room. There's a monster here and here, and you're over here. What do you want? Can you see the working door? So cool. Working door, and it's hard to do sideways, but working secret door. <gasps> One of the walls. I have never done D and D. Before and I now I really want to do it. <laughs> that is well, super. Have you have you used that in your gaming group yet? Have you got it together? Yet, I haven't got a complete room done yet. Um, but uh, but we're looking forward. And they make he makes um medieval villages. Uh, there's there's dungeon set. There's a cavern set. There's a sewer set. There's a house and building set. And there's a castle set coming up later this year. And so, yeah, as, as a person who can do those 3D designs, that stuff is labor intensive because you've got to do, you know, a wall and a floor and then a bent wall and then a floor at an angle and, and oh, so and many variations. Floor, a half floor and a floor with a hole in it. And, a floor with a and, no, and never are you like, well, I'll just plug and play these two to, oh, they don't <laughs> go together, you know, never. <laughs> well, my goal is to have a village with a dungeon under it. We um. Are you gonna? Are you going to like have the have the village on top and then lift it off? Yes. And yes. I want dungeon. to have the houses on top of the dungeon, and then the dungeon has a busted wall that leads to the cave system, and just reveal it as they go. And and we um uh, we we uh, right now we're gaming in the Dungeons and Dragons world, but we just finished two years of gaming in the world of my books. We we played a year long campaign that takes place right after the second book, about a month after the second book. What what rule set did you use for that? 
For that, we use a, a rule set called the Fate Core system. Do you know it? I know Fate Core, yes. Yep, yep. Fate is, um, I think everyone that wants to write should play Fate. Because I, it, I think they recently did a, a tabletop episode. Will Wheaton did a tabletop episode yes, with Fate Core last week. week. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very interested in that. I have not, I have not watched it yet. Um, I watched about halfway through. I have to admit, I'm not a big fan of of RPG D and D storytelling games. Uh, a lot of times, it just feels like the DM's the only one playing the game, and everyone's just kind of rolling dice for him, you know. But uh, Fake Court looks pretty good, so I'll, I'm going to try and muscle through the episode and see if I can get my interest in it up. Well, Fate is um, it, it, it's a lot more player driven. Sorry. I apologize for the shoes. My daughter running fast in heels. Um, That's all right. It's uh, it's a lot more player driven. And it's a lot more. Um, I mean, I love both systems, but Fate models. They're they're not trying to model reality or credible reality. They're trying to model the way that oh, that's beautiful. Uh, storytelling unfolds. They're trying to model the kinds of things that happen in narrative, in cinema, and novels. So I find it really, really instructive as a writer to play Fate. Uh, that's beautiful. I want to go back to the Royal Game of Ur. So okay. So that- here's here's my thinking. We've got a game set up here, and and oh, cool. my son would love to play against you a quick game. Now we've set it up with with letters across the bottom and numbers across the side. The Black Draug is at A five. Okay. And uh, would you like to play a little game while we talk about the Royal Game of Ur here? Sure. Sure. So, Gabe, uh, do you want to play the Black Draug? Do you want to play the Draug or the Jarl? Mm. I think you should let him show us what the the Draug can do. Cool beans. Jarl. Okay. So, who goes first, the Draug or the Jarl? Do you? We know this. I don't remember. The Draug. The Draug go first? Okay, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Lou, it's your move, and then we'll take a question about Ur, or what you want to say about Ur. All right, so 4A, if I'm reading correctly. Okay. So 4A to, to, oh, come on, Dad. To just a 4B? Just a 4B. Mm-hmm. Okay, interesting. Now, see, I, I always, my first move is to take the black drug and move them over to these squares to try and block off the Jarl's escape from that corner. So, interesting. Okay, get, while, while you make your move, let's talk about the Royal Game of Ur. So okay, so to, to wrap up, so after I cobbled together different uh, systems of, of Fenefetafel, I added some of my own rules, I polished it all, made it fit, and I took it to my nephews who are chess champions in the state of Alabama where I live. And I let them play each other for three hours at a Starbucks. And um, after three hours, I had to pry the game out of their hands. <laughs> that's when I knew I had something. So the second book comes out. And we have to do a game for the second book. And in the second book, the chariot it's a race racing. The, yeah, the, the it's chariot like racing is, is a big, big part of it. So uh, I wanted a game that, that emulated chariot racing. And we made a dice racing. I, I made a dice racing game. It's not based on anything, but I looked at backgammon, and then I looked at some of the historical uh, precedents to backgammon, and I looked at Sinet, the Egyptian game, and I looked at the Royal Game of Ur. Yes. And uh, what I came up with isn't Sinet, isn't Ur, isn't, isn't backgammon. But uh, it definitely has roots. It, all yes. of these games kind of go back to the same root system, exactly. and whether it's this or Senate, I, we don't know. And uh, I'm really proud of it. The game's called Charioteers. You have four playing pieces, but you only have to get two of them across the finish line to win the game. And then you can keep the other two pieces in play to mess with the other players and help figure out who's going to come in second, third, and fourth. All right, wait. We've moved? Okay. All right. He moved, so it's your turn now. Uh, while While you're deciding what your move is, I noticed that you did similar to this game where it's essentially uh, flipping dice. You know, you reduce the dice roll to a 50-50 where if it's odd, you, you count it, or if it's even, you don't, or other way around. And this game is the same way. Now, the thing about rolling multiple dice or flipping multiple coins is it's an uneven distribution. Most of the time, you're going to get a, a roll in the middle. 
uh, more often than not. Did you consider that while you were making that that decision? Yes, I um, I went with. Uh, have you looked at the second game? Have you seen it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In fact, oh, my my other son three D modeled that game. I haven't printed it out yet, so it'll be coming. <laughs> Oh. He does not like it. Dad does not like it. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's it's not that I don't like it. I, 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 I when you took dice and turned them in, or when you took dice and turned them into a coin flip, I'm like, why not just use coins? <laughs> and I feel the same way about the Royal Game of Ur. I'm like, why why have these dice with four sides if you're just going to turn them into coins? Like, have one of them that has three sides and one of them that has one and make it so that which dice you choose is an important part of the game or something like that so that you can adjust your percentages. Well, nobody does that. So. Well, explain to me again why you don't like Dungeons & Dragons with its, <laughs> with its polyhedral dice. Um, well, I like the dice. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you like the dice, you're halfway there. Um, yeah, it's true. Yeah, I, I uh, actually, because I, you know, uh, um, because at the time I was also working on a role playing game, which I ended up abandoning, and I was looking at different dice systems specifically, and I and I came across a dice system that was based on the the, the number of evens and odds you rolled, and thought that was fascinating, and also because I've got those really cool icons on the uh, on the corners of the title Thrones and Bones on the cover, and so I've made my own yeah, set of probably. of dice. That have um, I just got blank dice from a craft store and, and printed out stickers, but they've got those icons on the dice, and the uh, the rooster head means you have to stop, and the snake head means you move forward. Mm. So uh, I'd like to make custom dice for it one day. Well, you could three D print them. In fact, I have yes, a I video. Very... <laughs> I have a video about how you can do that with. Uh, now I did it with Blender. I think I should make one where you can do it with Tinkercad because that's a much easier program to work with. Yeah. All right. Have you got a re Have you got a response to to this move? Uh, I am gonna go F one to F G. F F what? F one to F G. Just move right, one space to your. The G one, or yeah, oh G one. I'm sorry, G one, G one. Gotcha. Sorry. Excellent. Sorry, it's a little weird. All right. So while while we let my son work that out, um, yeah, I I made a I made another board game a little while ago called uh, Tardis Run, and I really played with the percentages, and my thinking on that one was, uh, uh I would make it so that since you know that you're more likely to throw well. Since I knew that I was more likely to make a certain role. Wow, moving out with the Jarl already. Yeah, I just have to change my. All right. It's actually, uh, I'm going to change. That you would instead choose which character you were going to move and then roll the dice. The idea being you could choose uh, uh, what, your, what your person could, or, or who you were going to send in to do whatever, but you couldn't control what they were doing. Play tested that a couple times. It was not satisfying. It was not fun to play. And so I, I abandoned that for a more traditional uh, uh, setup. I'm trying to angle this so you can see those the, the, the shield maiden behind the Jarl there. Yeah, yeah, thank you. All righty. So my son has short up the Jarl and put him in. Um, let's see, what else about board games do we want to talk about while you decide your move? Or have you got a move for this one? I am. Oh, I, I did want to talk about the asymmetrical nature of, of Taffel games. So we'll, we'll get to that after you make your move. Oh, yeah, you got some questions. Actually, do you want to ask your question while he makes his move? Mm -hmm. so Let me go 5H okay. to 6H. 5H to 6H. Okay. Okay. All right. okay, so ask your first question and make your move. How, how did you get all the imagination for all the books, everything in it. Whew, that's a big question. For <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? I could never. That's no, I, I, Everybody asks that question, too. Where do you get your inspiration from? And, yeah. I grew up on fantasy. I was a huge fan of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings growing up, and obviously Dungeons and & Dragons, and, uh, and the, the – and, and, 
the very small number of fantasy movies we had when I was young. And uh, I, I think I, I, I love mythology. Um, I have a love hate with history and, and uh, or an on again, off again love with history. And I just, I, I pulled from everything. I pulled from a lot of Norse mythology, a lot of Norse history. I pulled from a lot of world history. Um, you know, I've read as an editor, I, I edited over 200 books. And yet when I look at my own novels, you know, I've read thousands of novels. When I look at what I've written, all the influences I see come from the stuff I read when I was uh, uh, young. I, I'm always, I'm al almost shocked at how, at how, uh, how many of the influences are, are, are bedrock stuff. It's been in my head since I was eight or 10 or 12. Yeah, it's it's funny how you know the influence of our of our early childhood really just lingers with us for a long time in good ways, great ways. Well, also, I mean, in in the 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 scene where they fall into the rapid river and they're worried about drowning, uh, I used to whitewater raft in Tennessee, and I've rafted the river there, the the rivers there under some flood conditions, and I never fell out, but I've been in places where if you fell out, it would have been quite dangerous. And so I drew on that. And uh, I used to go snow skiing every year. Uh, I haven't done it in decades, but I love skiing through the woods at high speed. Yeah, we're, is, we're living out here in Utah, and I grew up in Colorado, and I've never skied. <laughs> and here I am in Alabama, where you know we're lucky if we get a crust of ice on the ground once a year. Um, yeah, but, uh, but it's, I, it's really a case I, of when you can do it at any time, Time, you're just like, yeah, I'll get to it eventually, and you never do. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Wait, did you move? He 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 moved. Okay. He, he doesn't want me to point out that there's this this wide open column right here. On, on, I'm oh, I'm sorry. There. I want to go. I want to go. Uh, not um. No, it's that. It's. I think it's F nine. Uh huh. God. And I and bring me bring me to F to to F six. A six? Oh, I'm sorry, that's just five. Five. I can't tell. And that means I remove the, the shield maiden. Nope. What? Oh, oh right you. there? Yes. Six. Two. Yes, so I take that shield maiden. Oh, All okay. Right. And I win. Uh, a lot of times these taffle games are extremely imbalanced. And so what I and I'm sure you found this in your research, that a lot of times these taffle players uh the, the people who play these taffle games instead of instead of uh uh yeah well that's fine instead of instead of uh playing to win you switch sides afterwards and whoever wins fastest is the winner you yes, know it's, yes. it's assumed that the that the king's going to escape i i it's forgot to do it in less than 10 turns etc all right yeah, did, you yeah. move again? did you just move again he did he moved here the king is about to escape out to the left or the right and i don't think there's anything you can do to stop him uh, I believe. Oh wait, there's something you can totally do to stop him. No. I forgot. Six yeah, because six e. the Jarl can be captured just like anybody else when uh -huh. he gets away from the throne. He's away from the throne. Uh -huh. Well, that's that's actually a rule that I had to that we clarified just before. So my son was working under the assumption that the oh, Jarl right can four. be captured on all four no, sides. It make him impossible to to um to capture it all under those conditions yeah okay so the jarl now when he's on the throne he has to be surrounded yeah, on all, all four, four sides side. and when he's again but no when he gets off on this side though he has to be surrounded on three, three side. If you're one but, past they, that. but once they get further away from there they can be captured just like anybody else and the black drow can too so do you want to take back that move and try again yeah all um, right so the game is still on we're going to rewind and try again now that we know right. Um, what's your yeah, there, are, there are versions of the game where the Jarl has to escape from one of the four corners. And my guess is if I, if I had that rule so that where he can escape from was restricted, then capturing him on all four sides anywhere might also work. Might also work. But I think that you did good. Not all of the Taffel variations have the, the uh, uh, borrows that you've created here be right. always hostile. And that forces him to have to do a jig around. Now there is still this move, you know, that's fairly right. simple, but uh, uh, yeah, it's it's fairly good. So, what's your next question? Uh, how do you come up with those rules for all the games? How do you? 
Don't take the camera. Buddy. How do you do that? Well, like I said, with this one, I, I I took a lot of inspiration from existing Tapple games, and I'm a, I'm very proud. Board Game Geek now lists Thrones and Bones as a a game. I know, I saw that. Game. I yeah, actually I'm used really those proud rules. of that. I with, actually used those rules for a slideshow that I'm making. Oh, cool. I, I even at the bottom left corner said uh, praise to that I put down the um, address for that website. For for the board game geek, which, yeah. yeah, it's very cool. Well, and, and the thing is, board game geek is trying to get charity tiers, but it doesn't. So I had to write up what uh, I know from the rules in it. You know, maybe if I got your email, I'd be able to just email it to you, and you could see what I've got so far. Yeah, I've got a email. Well, so, so charity tiers was a lot more uh, whole cloth. based on the, it wasn't the, um, based on any one thing. I was more trying to duplicate what happened in the actual chariot races. Yeah. And, Which, um, I noticed you got it from uh, a show called Ben Hur. I noticed a lot of this stuff. <laughs> uh, I didn't get it from Ben Hur. Ben Hur got it from history, but, I, I, and I confess, I've never watched Ben Hur all the way through. Um, wow. I started watching Ben Hur and I skipped to the chariot race and I just watched the chariot race of Ben Hur over and over. Well, it's it's iconic. Okay. That particular um, that particular yeah. scene has become tropes for Star uh, Wars. Yeah, and, yeah, all well, over. But at the part where the guy got flattened by the horses, hoping that was the dummy. No, there's a story that that was a real guy. I don't. I, I I've heard that that's not true. But uh, uh, who knows? You know, yeah, you're, 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 someone was killed making it. But you know, a lot of the stuff they used to say, you now go to Snopes and find out it's not true. Um. It uh, there was also a, a a person had done for teaching purposes a, uh, a a reconstruction of a chariot race done with computer animation with CGI that was really beautiful, and it's it's on YouTube and it's only like three minutes long. But I watched that over and over and over again. Another person, and I don't know why anyone would do this, did a a video. Uh, uh, it was a CGI reconstruction of what it looks like to see water flowing through the inside of an aqueduct. Okay, and I, it's it's you know it's like if someone put a go throw, go pro camera and threw it into an aqueduct, and, and it just um, it it I don't know why anyone would be inspired to create that, but I was so thankful because I have a scene where they shoot through an aqueduct. Yep, and, yep, I yep. love that. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> and, you know, why take a bath in your clothes? It helps it wait. It helps keep time for laundry. <laughs> Although. So you read um, the first two books. Have you read the third book too now? Oh yeah. Which book? Although, um, which book you like better? Um, that's an impossible question. I love them all equally. That's a great answer. I'll go with that. You you, you should compliment him on on getting better as he goes on. <laughs> his last book. You know. Well, actually, I want I actually want you to make a fourth book. Four, please. I demand a sequel. I, I need one. But, I but that means more board games. Yeah, duh. Why else? Why not? Board games. Okay, so what's your response, Lou? All right. Um, where'd he move? Uh, I think he just moved the shield maiden over to, to block off the the Jarl again. Okay, well, in that case, nine, eight, seven, six. Let's go 6A to 6E. And, and eat up that shield maiden? Yep, you got that shield maiden. Plan for that shield maiden. Well, no plans. Okay. Ooh, no, no, not gonna do that. that. You can do that. You're safe. Uh, well, not. No, he can't because if he does that, then you oh, come. Because I move forward. Right, right, right. I. So I move. I move there. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm gonna go. Ooh, now I have two happy choices. <laughs> the, the board is, you know, it's, it's, it's favoring looking at it from the angle that we are and not from the angle. There's nothing happening over here. <laughs> um, I want to turn it around, but I feel like... I think I'll just the, pull that E8 down to close off the Yarl. E8 up here, oh, keep your yeah. in his place, and keep you from taking the draw. Yes. 
I, you know what? I would do. I would move it one down here so that you have your pick yeah. of drug to kill. I was. I was trying to go for a double kill. All right. I have. I have found so far three double kills, and uh, I was gonna make it a total of four, but then you blocked me off. So let me go B four to <laughs> D four. B four. B four to D four. If I, I'm doing oh, slide. B four to D four. And, and he takes off another shield maiden. Yep. Eat your heart out. No, keep going. One more. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. All uh, right. First, first blood for the shield maiden. <laughs> hey. Sorry, that was okay. Me. I. Do you have another question? Uh, yeah. Um, I so. Four, F4. Four. If I'm, if I'm, if your camera's gone blurry, so I'm not sure. Yeah. And I take two out. Boom there. And uh, boom there. I think this is going to end quickly. Right, I'm gonna take a you better ask another question. <laughs> yeah, you better ask. Actually, we've got time for one more question and then we've got to go. Oh, uh, but the game. We're not done. Oh, it, it will be pretty quickly. Go on. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not, I've got three questions. Ask them. Okay. How did you get the Sphinx's riddle? Like, did you get your hands on a joke book and just. <laughs> Did the Sphinx's riddles come from a joke book? That's, that's no, it didn't. I, 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 um, I searched riddles. I spent a long time oh, uh, uh, I, looking I, at other riddles and trying to find like the pattern to riddles that okay. I could duplicate. And I had written several. I think I have an extra riddle that never made the book. Um, but I, I, uh, I, I spent a long, long time trying to come up with something that sounded like the riddles that you get from like the story of Oedipus and things like that. Oedipus. Yeah. 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 Uh, let's see. Well, what's your next move? And the next question is, why did you use only, uh, the only more creatures from more everyone knows? You can like, oh, wait, no. I mean, Okay. I mean, the mega hive is still technically a law that everybody knows. I mean, you did kind of. Did you make so, a mega hive? So, wow, he's he's knocking you for for not being creative enough and leaning uh, too much on the. Force. I um, you know what I want to do with the monsters is I I want to, one of my pet peeves is when in in both games and stories where you turn a corner and there's a mummy. And then you walk around, and there's a lizard man, and then you turn a corner, and there's a minotaur. And I don't like when the monsters are outside of their ecology. You know, I think they should belong to an ecosystem the same way that natural animals occur. You know, we don't have mongooses here in Alabama that I'm aware. Right. And, uh, and so it was very important to me that the monsters all come from where they come from. So in the second book, the Tetzel Worm. Tetzel worms are a, a oh, yeah, I remember that. I remember that. They're from they're from Switzerland. That's where they're found. You don't find them anywhere else, just Switzerland. And uh, and gnomes originated in Switzerland too. The earliest story of a gnome was was from a Swiss and uh, tale. So I, I it's very important to me that the monsters are part of the the, the, the their region of the world that they come from. Uh, when they did the audio books, they asked me a really interesting question that I had not thought about, and they said. Do you want all the monsters to sound the same as if uh, they're all coming from, you know, another world or the, the fairy realm or something? Or do you want them to sound like the, the, the people around them? And I said, well, as we go deep in the city, the monsters are going to be living and working alongside other people. So I want all monsters to speak in the accent of their region. And I, I mean, I tried to make everything in the books sound different. I did my best on that. When you were when you were doing it, yeah, yeah. All right, uh, Lou, have you got a move for us? All right. Um, let's. Do you have any other questions, or is that? Let's go. Six B to six D. Six B. Yep. Uh, six. B to six D. Six B. There's no six B. Oh, I'm sorry. That's six. Uh, five B. Five B. Five B. Five B. And then just go over to five D. The way the right. board is angled, no, I, I can't quite. I have to. Yeah. I, I'm the sort of person who I'm. I'm just plain tired of of the tropes 
Um, so you got to move the Jarl out to here. But uh, I'm just tired of the of the tropes of dungeons and and you know uh, all all of those things. And so I, I try to get away from it. And and I, I appreciate that you've added to uh, the lore by saying, yeah, let's make the regions make sense. Let's not just be putting monsters anywhere. Let's let's make some degree of, of sense out of all of this. And I, I think that if you do anything in any of these worlds, you have to add to it in some way, or there's no point to it being there. There is a, um, a writer that I, I worked with when I was an editor named James Ng. And he asked at one point, is it even possible to write about unicorns anymore? Or have they been my little ponied to death? Right. And I thought that was a great question. And then his next like book. They, 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 were mentioned, they were mentioned in the third book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, that's the thing. He's, he answered that question. And, and what was your, how did you make him fresh again? James himself answered. In his next book, he has the main character wake up on a hillside at night and be attacked by a unicorn. And it's incredibly dangerous and deadly and frightening. And uh, I think it's not the trope, it's how you wield it. Uh, you know, I, I, um, I used to work with Mike Resnick. Somebody once wrote of Mike Resnick that he never, he never met a cliche he didn't like, but he holds them like a deck of cards in an expert poker player's hand, throwing them out right when, it, right when they're needed. And, well, uh, there's, there's a lot to be said for sticking with the tropes that your, your audience has an easier time uh, of identifying with characters and situations uh if if you don't the, one of the reasons why the matrix you remember the matrix oh yes was so powerful was that it didn't spend any time introducing the world you knew the world the world was city life done let's move on and get you right into the story and so yeah there's a lot of power in sticking with the tropes and i uh the game i had behind me at the beginning of the movie or the beginning of this video uh, Wood Wars, I tried to like break all the tropes and do my own thing and oh boy, has that been a headache. <laughs> uh, Lou, have you decided on a crushing move? I am looking for a crushing move. Now, do you um, mind that you are playing the creator of the game. You don't have any chance. Oh yeah, and if I win? You don't have um, any chance. You keep... All right, let's see. Let's go. G. Yeah, that one. Take him all the way up. No, not all the way up. Not all the way up. Not all the way. Up. Stop right there. There. Hey. There we go. Do I have any advice? Well, I'm glad he didn't take the shield maiden right here. I thought that you were going to be Jack when he took her. I would say at this point, you need to move her out of the way. And you can, well, if you move her here, he can take her there easily enough. So you probably have to move her over here to keep her safe. But that's taking her out of being useful. Or you can bring her all the way down here and capture that frog. We can do that, right? We can pass through the throne, but we can't stop, can't stop on it. You can't stop on it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good move. Now. Now, at this point, well, I shouldn't discuss strategy I'm at all go, with, the, uh, with the key strategies here. F4 to F5. Oh, lock the Jarl in. Oops. Okay, and you can't move on to that drow, that, that spot there. He so he's, Wait, did he just kill you? Yep. Oh! <laughs> Good game. Good game. <laughs> Laugh it. Good job. Well, there we go, guys. That's how you play Thrones and Bones. And if you want to download, to talking to the audience now, if you want to download this set, the files are on My Mini Factory. Uh, I believe there's already a link in the description. Uh, this will, this has been sized to print on a mini. I just want to show you, uh, take apart one of these pieces. So everything is small and interlocked, and it, it'll print on any 3D printer. Um, Except for one that's like 
Yay big. And of course, the finishing with nail polish, if that's cool stuff. So but don't put it away just yet. Leave it out for a little while longer. Well, uh, we are we are up against time. I think we got to go. Uh, um, so, Lou, is there anything else you'd like to add before we go? Um, uh, people can find out more at louanders.com. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on all the things you're supposed to be on. And uh, there is a new book coming out next year. It's not in the Thrones and Bones series, but it is in the Thrones and Bones world. Uh, okay. We'll have a board game associated with this it. This one won't have a board game. I'm taking a break from the board games. I'm sorry. Uh, I will save that for Thrones and Bones books. No, it does not. It's set in a in a faux English country about with knights and dragons. But this is good. See, this is this is the way a lot of books go. They have the the initial trilogy, and then the fourth book they explore some other aspect of the world. So that's what's it going to be called? Have you got a working title yet? Well, the working title is the Dragon Squire. Uh, my, I'm not sure if we're keeping that title or not. My editor has changed every one of my titles so far. So it's currently called the Dragon Squire, but I don't know if that's what it's going to be called. Well, we'll just, we'll just uh, keep an eye on Goodreads for anything coming up by Lou Anders and just snatch it up because uh, uh, he loves every single one of the books that you've done. Thank you. Well, are you going to read yeah. the rest? Have you seen the short story on Boy's Life? Short story on Boy's Life? You go to boyslife.org, the May 2016 issue last year. I had a story called Cory and the Troll, which is about Karn's father when he was his age, when he was Karn's age, encountering a troll. Ooh, so all we gotta do is, is hit Boy's Life, which is a magazine, and on their website, go back to the 2016, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll rewind it and find out where that is. They have, uh, a fiction, they have a fiction site on their website, and uh, or you can just Google Cory and the Troll, K-O-R-I. Corey and the Troll. I'm going to pull that up right uh, now so that we'll check it out later. Uh, honestly, I think I'd be more interested in book four of the actual Thrones and Bones. Oh, don't get picky. <laughs> Come on. This is, this is a lovely thing with, with interviewing young people. Well, I'll tell you, if we get a fourth Thrones and Bones book, the plan was originally to head toward an Egyptian culture. Well, you've already got set, and, and your chariot race is already a little bit like set. Although maybe we can maybe we can discuss uh, uh, Tardis Run and and the Game of Birth and see if we can come up with something. Uh, what I did differently for Tardis Run was I had the uh, one player start on one side, one player start on the other side. They race towards each other through the middle, uh, whereas. The game of fur have them both running the same direction. Right. And I'm not sure which one's better. I, you know, they, they it, it feels a lot more confrontational when you're running towards them, but you get more opportunities to leapfrog over people and have a damage them if you're running the same direction. So you know, who was the other Tardis? The other Tar the what? In Tardis run, you are they both Tardis? You're saying Tardis like well, Doctor? I, so it's a it's a Doctor Who game. Let me see if I got it back here. Uh, there we go. Um, and there's a video for it on there, but it's, it's oh, the whole board fits inside the TARDIS here. And the pawns that you're playing with are various incarnations of the Doctor. So oh, here we nice, go. Nice, nice. Okay. I, I don't know if you're a fan of the classic series or the new series, but both. the only new ones. Both. I mean, I've got uh, I've got some uh, attack eyebrows. Peter Capaldi here, best doctor ever. Uh, you know what? He, I don't know. They they each taken some time to grow on me. Uh, then we've also got some new and classic enemies. We've got the Dalek, of course. You got to have the Daleks. Those are nice. Um, but then we've also got like the I don't know if anybody knows the K the K one robot from. Uh, uh, the second Doctor's run, and I mean, it, it was it was an old old series, and uh, most of the most of the monsters have shown up in the new one, but the K one will never show up. Uh, <laughs> but I love the design of him. He's so he's so seventies sci fi. Nice. You know, my kids are are amazed anyone was ever scared of Daleks. <sighs> it's true. It's really true. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but what I had done for this game, and I, I'll, I'll just talk about it briefly. There's a video that you can watch. 
is I, I decided that since we're do, tossing paddles, we'll just have paddles. Since we're tossing dice, I'll just have paddles. But notice some of them have two dots and some of them only have one. And then there's this other paddle that gets thrown in that has one dot on one side and then a times two on the other side which throws off the, the curve so it becomes more difficult to predict what you're going to do. So you just and toss those like you tie dice. Exactly. You just shake them up, drop them on the table, heads or tails. And when, when they found said it, they found what they thought were paddles because they were painted on one side and they presumed that that's the way that it's played. Again, we've lost all the rules, so who knows. Could you imagine trying to recreate the rules of Monopoly from just the pieces of the game? No. Yeah. Anyway, so it has been a pleasure. I would love to, to keep in contact with you and chat with you in the future, but uh, we've got to go, and it sounds like you've got to go as well. So um, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. And if anybody has any, if anybody watching has any questions, uh, there will be links in the description to everything we've talked about. And if I miss anything, leave a comment, and I will put a link in there. <laughs> Well, thank you both uh, very, very much. And I'm so impressed and honored and, and thrilled by the set. I don't know what to do. Also, well, I don't have to be embarrassed that I lost. No, no. And, you know, this is 3D printing, so you can have your own. Just download the files and print them off yourself, Lou. You don't have to, you don't have to envy him from a distance. You can, you can own it yourself. Isn't that cool? And the best part is if you play it with the tournament thing, where people can take yours, I don't really like that rule. Uh, you can just print up a new set. The problem is we yep. printing things. Well, I'm also I'm thinking about combining board games and role playing games and having that you know that old trope where somebody stumbles on a giant set and has to play on it. Yes, so that might be perfect to print that set out and then have the players take a couple of the pieces positions. You could you could do that in your RPG game. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yes, <laughs> that would be awesome. You know, that my five be. players, my five guys, my five players would have to take on five of the of the shield maidens' positions. Shield maidens die fast. I know. It. <laughs> I know. It. That that would be the point in the game where where you have your noble sacrifice because too easy. Yeah. Yeah and, and, yeah, and they have to get, like, an automated Jarl out of the game yep. in order to move on. Wow, that would be cool, man. I can't. Well, that. I, was, I started to say I, I, uh, I can't do it in the book because I did. They, they do play in a live chess game in the third book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yep. But you can do it. You can add this to. I don't, I'm not sure somebody's done that, but you can add this to your RPG game. That would be so cool. If you do that, I, I would be honored to see you. And I'm sure he would be honored to see you printing out his set that he created and, and using it in a game like that. That would be so cool. All right, well, we will talk to you another time. Thank you so much for your time today. My and pleasure. We'll see you later. Y'all take care.